Hello everyone and welcome back for more Limited Review Week. I'm Nita Hone and every time a new set is fully spoiled, I do a full set review in the time between it being spoiled and the pre-release. So far this week, I've looked at white, blue, and black, and today I continue with red. Before we get into the cards, here's a quick reminder on how I grade them. If you've seen this before, you can skip it by clicking on the timestamp in the description below that will take you to the first card in this review. Just like with Amenket, I'm using letter grades to help me to explain how good I think these cards will be in the new format, and I will provide a letter grade for every card after discussing each of them. These grades are an easy way of summing up what I have to say about the card, and have to do with how highly I can see myself taking them. To help convey what each of these grades mean, I'm going to provide examples of cards from Amenket that I think deserve each of these letter grades. Let's start with A. Cards that are in A are bombs and incredibly efficient removal and are the kind of cards that you want to be first picking or are so powerful that they pull you into their color. There are not a ton of A's in any format, and I'm pretty stingy with them. They are the best cards in the set, and the vast majority of them are mythic or rare, though occasionally uncommons make it into the A range. Some examples of A's from Amon Ket are cards like Angel of Sanctions and Glorybringer. These two cards are insane and so powerful that they can win games on their own, both providing large flying bodies and the ability to remove other creatures, making them very powerful. Next, let's look at Bs. These cards are obviously not quite as good as As, but are still very good and are in cases where there isn't a huge A level bomb in the pack, still cards I'm happy to take with a first pick or an early pick. These are very good removal spells and very efficient creatures with powerful abilities. They aren't quite as game or draft warping as As are, but seeing them past pick 4 or 5 is a pretty good signal that a color is open and for you to jump into it. Most Bs are of uncommon rarity or higher, though occasionally commons can make it into the B range as well. Some examples of Bs from Mom and Cat are Oncrop Crasher and Angler Drake. These cards are very powerful and can help shift the game in your favor and are good at any stage of the game, but they aren't cards that completely warp a game when they are played, like let's say Angel of Sanctions or Glorybringer. Still, both of these cards are ha cards I'm happy to first pick and ecstatic to get any later than that. Next, we have Cs. This is what the vast majority of cards in a set are, and they appear at every rarity with regularity. Solid and playable cards that you neither feel good or bad about having in your deck is sort of the definition of a C. These are decent creatures like 2 mana 2-2s two with some small upside and solid removal. Some examples of Cs from Amon Keter cards like Colossipede, just a 5 mana 5-5, five five, sure, it's fine, and Cursed Minotaur, a 3 mana 3-2 with Menace. These are both cards that you feel fine about having in your deck, but you don't exactly feel excited about. From there, we move to Ds. These are cards that are playable, but just barely, and are cards that you generally aren't happy to have in your deck. They usually only end up there when something went wrong in your draft, like being unsure about what colors you should be in so you don't end up with enough playables, and thus you're forced into playing cards of this level. There were actually a lot of Ds in Amonkhet because cycling made what would otherwise be Fs into Ds. Some examples of Ds are Violent Impact and Watchers of the Dead. Neither of them really does enough to be card you're excited about having in your deck. Watchers of the Dead is a 2 mana 2-2 two -two with no real upside, and Violent Impact is a bad artifact removal spell that happens to have cycling. You'll play them when you have to, but you don't really want to. Finally, we have Fs. These are cards that I think you should never ever put into your deck and are terrible. Just like there aren't many As in this set, there usually aren't many Fs, but they are always around. Weirdly, there are actually a decent number of rares and mythics in this category, since they often like printing unique and strange effects on cards of that rarity. Some examples of Fs from Amonkhet are Glorious End, just is a terrible card. Any card that says you lose the game on it is probably not something you want to play. You had to end up in a very narrow situation for it to actually work. You had to cast it on your opponent's turn and be able to kill them on your next turn, otherwise you just lose. Um, and Hazaret's Monument just doesn't basically does nothing. You don't really want to be playing the card. It doesn't have a big enough impact on the game. It's not worth the card in general. In addition to these more clear-cut grades, there are also two categories of cards that I will present more than one grade for. The first of these are sideboard cards. These are cards that generally you don't want to have in your main board. They're either a D or an F if they're in your main board, but they are better in certain matchups out of your sideboard. An example of this from Amonkhet is Stinging Shot. It is a D in your main board, since it will frequently never have a target and just get cycled, but out of your sideboard it gets all the way into the B range because it's incredibly efficient removal for dealing with flyers. The other cards I will present two grades for are build around cards. These are cards that are generally a D or an F in your average limited deck, but if you manage to get enough synergies, they become much better. An example of this from Amon Ket would be Nest of Scarabs, an unplayable card in basically any limited deck, 
But if you end up with 10 or more ways to make minus one, minus one counters, it moves all the way into the C plus and B minus range. I do want to mention a few caveats before we get into discussion of red cards in Hour of Devastation. These grades are all based on my first impressions of the card, as obviously I haven't had a chance to play with any of them since the set was just spoiled in the pre-releases this weekend. These impressions are based on years of playing Magic and drafting a ton, and it is basically definite that I will be wrong about some of these cards, as it is not always possible to judge a card without actually playing with it. With Amonkhet, I went back and provided new grades for about 10% of the cards a few weeks after my initial limited review, after I'd had a chance to draft the format a bunch. Um, and, I, and missing on 10%, I think, is a reasonable uh, score for a limited review. I'd be happy to do that every time, because no one can perfectly predict how a limited format will play out. You have to play it to get the best understanding for it. Still, this is where these cards stand for me at the moment, and over time, I'll provide new grades for cards that either go up or down for me. Now, let's get started. First card we have is a braid, which for one generic and one red is an instant at uncommon, and it says choose one. A braid deals three damage to target creature or destroy target artifact. This is super efficient, instant speed removal, and kind of like lightning strike. It does three damage to something at two mana for an instant at instant speed. It can't hit players like lightning strike can, but it can blow up problem artifacts like Edifice of Authority or Ketra's Monument, and that's some pretty good upside. Not a ton more to say about this card. It's very good. I'd be happy to take it with the first pick, but it isn't going to break most games as soon as I play it, but I'm happy giving this a B. Next, we have Blur of Blades, which for one generic and one red is an instant that says, at common, that says, put a minus one, minus one counter on target creature. Blur of Blades deals two damage to that creature's controller. This will probably be the most useful as a combat trick. One to shrink your opponent's creature, so your creature doesn't die in combat, and the two damage it does doesn't hurt either if you're an aggressive deck because you're still getting to do the damage even though you're having to cast a spell to get through their blocker. You can obviously just use it to kill X1s too. On the whole, the card isn't super exciting, but it seems reasonable for an aggressive deck as it can help your creatures get through a blocker and keep turning sideways. Still, I'd rather have a combat trick that actually pumps my guy, but this doesn't seem terrible. There are also a few minus one minus one counter synergies around in this format, of course. Something red didn't get into as much in Triple Amon Ket, but it has a few more cards with minus one minus one counters in this set. On the whole, this card barely makes it into the decent filler category, though, and I'm going to give it a C minus. And if you're not playing an aggressive deck, you probably don't want it at all. Next, we have Burning Fist Minotaur, which for one generic and one red is a 2 1 Minotaur Wizard at Uncommon. It has first strike, and for one generic and one red, it's set and discarding a card. Burning Fist Minotaur gets plus two, plus zero until end of turn. Two mana, two ones with first strike are always something I'm in for. They aren't easy for your opponent to block or attack through in the early game. They have they hold equipment and auras really well because they become even more difficult to deal with. And this card comes with the additional bonus of being able to boost its power, making it even harder for opponents to effectively block or attack through, since you can always threaten to pump this. Discarding a card for this effect is kind of a bummer, since you can't just boost its power with all your mana, as you can with some creatures who can boost their power in red, but keeping spare lands in your hand once you have him in play, or having discard payoffs can help mitigate that. On the whole, I like this card, and I'm going to give it a B-. It's just the kind of two-drop that is relevant at all stages of the game, and is a real pain to deal with without removal. Next, we have Chandra's Defeat, the red card in this defeat cycle, which for one red is an instant, and it says, Chandra's Defeat deals five damage to target red creature or red planeswalker. If that permanent is a Chandra planeswalker, you may discard a card. If you do, draw a card. So this is another very good card in this cycle, but once again, it's unplayable in the main board. It gets an F. You can't guarantee you're going up against people playing red. But out of your sideboard, it's pretty awesome. One mana to do five damage to a creature at instant speed is actually pretty insane. Imagine if this to just do that to any creature. It would be basically the best card in the set. You want one of these in your sideboard every time you play red, if you can help it, and if you can manage to pick it up mid-pack or so, you should feel pretty good about it. It is an A out of your sideboard. Next, we have Chaos Maw, which for five generic and two red is a 6-6 six, six Hellion at rare. And it says when Chaos Maw enters the battlefield, it deals three damage to each other creature. This is a big scary guy. A seven mana 6-6 six, six isn't the best rate, but the fact that he takes out the majority of other creatures in the format when he enters the battlefield is incredibly powerful. I would feel okay about first picking a board sweeping creature like this in some packs, though the fact that it has a converter mana cost of seven can be a liability, so I wouldn't take it over good removal or anything. Though it's worth noting, if you get to seven mana against an aggro deck, they're probably just gonna lose because this will just wipe their board. I'm going to give it a B minus, indicating that it's, you know, sometimes a first pickable card, 
but most of the time it won't be. But it is the kind of card you should probably take a flyer on because it has a really high ceiling and is very powerful if your deck can get to seven mana. Next, we go to Crash Through, which for one red mana is a sorcery at common that says, creatures you control gain trample until end of turn, draw a card. I always like one mana cantrips a decent amount, especially in formats with a spell-heavy deck, which in this case is blue-red, and especially if they have an effect that can be impactful in addition to cantripping, and Crash Through works for that. Worst case, you're paying one mana to draw a card, kind of like one mana cycling without the upside of having a trigger for cycling effects, and in the best case, the trample you give your creatures actually matters. As we've already seen, red has big creatures who wouldn't mind getting trample, as do green and blue, so those are probably going to be the color pairs where this is at its best. Still, it is definitely not a card you find yourself wanting to mainboard unless your deck has just the right composition. Big monsters at the top of your curve were lots of cards that care about you casting non-creature spells. I'm going to give this a D+, since it just isn't the kind of card every red deck will play. In fact, very aggressive red decks who aren't going to have huge creatures and just lots of them should probably avoid it. Next, we have Defiant Kenra, who for one generic and one red is a 2-2 with a bunch of flavor text. So, two mana 2-2s two are now something that red is getting all the time, um, and that they're also getting it with upside sometimes, and Defiant Kenra doesn't give you that. It's just a two mana 2-2, two two, doesn't have a useful creature type, doesn't have any useful synergies. It's the kind of two drop you'll put into your deck if you need more two drops, and certainly red aggressive decks will, but there's way better two drops to go around, the kinds that have exert and additional value on them instead of just being a two mana 2-2. Two two. Um, and so Defiant Kenra is a D plus. It's the kind of two drop you'll play if you have to. If you don't have enough two drops in your aggressive deck, it'll certainly fill that role. It just won't do anything special. Next, we have Earthshaker Kenra, which is one generic and one red for a 2-1 Jackal Warrior at rare. And it has haste. And it has when Earthshaker Kenra enters the battlefield, target creature with power less than or equal to Earthshaker Kenra's power cannot block this turn. And it has Eternalize for four generic and two red which means you can pay that much mana, exile it from your graveyard, and you get a 4-4 black zombie jackal warrior creature token with all the same text on it other than Eternalize, obviously. Um, and this thing's pretty good. This is a very good rare. It's another red or white creature that makes blocking difficult. At least this one's at rare instead of uncommon. Um, a 2 mana 2-1 two with haste, who can make a 2 power or less creature unable to block, is already a card you would play in any aggressive red deck and be, feel pretty good about. Adding Eternalize to the card gives it some amazing late game utility too. Like if your opponent manages to stabilize against your Onslaught, Lord Shaker Kenra can come out of the graveyard late and open up the floodgates by making a creature with power 4 or less unable to block and being able to swing as a 4-4 himself thanks to haste. This is a 2-mana two 2-1 two with all kinds of upside, and it looks like red-white aggro is still going to be pretty good in this format, so I'm actually willing to take this Kenra pretty highly, giving it a solid B. Next, we have Fervent Paincaster, which for 2 generic and 1 red is a 3-1 human wizard at uncommon, and it has two activated abilities. One of them is that it can tap to do 1 damage to target player, and the other is that you can tap it and exert it, meaning it won't untap during your next untap step to have it do 1 damage to target creature. I like this card a lot. 3 mana for a 3-1 isn't the worst stats, though certainly not something you would be play if that's all it was, but it does mean it can trade reasonably well in combat if it has to, with creatures with up to 3 toughness. On top of that, it has the ability to ping your opponent every turn, and if you choose to exert it, it can go full-on Prodigal Sorcerer and start hitting creatures too. This is an excellent red uncommon, and a card you can feel okay about first picking in some packs, and one that you're happy to have in basically every red deck, so I'm going to give it a B-. Next, we have Firebrand Archer, which for one generic and one red is a 2-1 human archer and it, at common, and it says, whenever you cast a non-creature spell, Firebrand Archer deals one damage to each opponent. Firebrand Archer is another card that seems like it will be most at home in the blue-red color pair. This is because if you don't have a solid number of non-creature spells, say seven or more, this amounts to just being a 2-mana two 2-1, two and as we've seen, red has better options than a vanilla 2-mana two 2-1. Two you'd run Defiant Kenra before you'd run that. Red does want two drops in general to keep their curve aggressive, so red decks, even without a large number of non-creature spells, will play this sometimes if they don't get enough two drops, so I'm going to give it a D in your typical limited deck. In a deck that has lots of non-creature spells, though, the archer pushes itself all the way up to C, as it is a nice source of extra damage and reach while you are casting your spells. Next, we have Frontline Devastator, which for three generic and a red is a 3-3 three, three zombie minotaur warrior at common. It has Afflict 2, and Afflict is a new mechanic in this format that's always assigned a numerical value, and that value always means how much damage your opponent's going to take when they block it. Um, and it also has one generic and one red to give itself plus one, plus zero until end of turn. 
This is an unexciting creature with Afflict, I think. A 4-mana 3-3 three, three is never anything to write home about. Even a 4-mana 3-3 three, three that can pump its own power, if that's all it was, it wouldn't be that good of a card. The Devastator can boost its power, like I said, but it can't boost its toughness, which means it still dies in combat to any creature with 3 power. Sure, it also gets in for some Afflict damage, making a trade a little more appealing, but I don't feel like this card is aggressive enough for its cost to really see a lot of play in red decks. It's a marginal playable, and I'm going to give it a C-. Next, we have Gilded Ceridon, which for four generic and one red is a 4-4 beast at common, and it says, whenever Gilded Ceridon attacks, if you control a desert, or there is a desert card in your graveyard, target creature can't block this turn. So this is the first card we've seen in this particular video that cares about deserts, but there are lots of them in this format. Uh, a 5-mana 4-4 four four is not something you usually want to be playing. However, if you can get a desert into play or into your graveyard, it suddenly becomes a very large goblin heal cutter. The ability to make creatures unable to block is very powerful, as we saw in Amonkhet and we've seen in other formats as well. Um, the Ceridon is slower and needs some setup, but if you can get there, he's an okay playable. The Ceridon is something of a build around with wanting you to run deserts, as it is probably not more than a D plus in a deck with zero deserts. A 5-mana 4-4 just isn't very good. However, once you have a few deserts, it moves easily into the C range, and I think it sort of caps out at the C plus range. It's going to be hard to be playing like more than three or four deserts, but if you're doing that, I think you're doing the right thing in playing your Gilded Ceridon, because it will frequently enough be able to make creatures unable to block. Next, we have Granitic Titan, which for four generic and two red is a 5-4 elemental at common with menace and cycling for two mana. This is another creature who is decent in the late game and comes with cycling so you can throw it away in the early game in an attempt to find more lands or spells you can cast in the early going. This type of card, as we saw in Amonkhet, isn't anything special, but it is certainly a solid playable because it allows you to do something with it at all stages of the game thanks to cycling. And in the late game, a 5-4 menace isn't anything to sneeze at either. I'm going to give this a C. Just regular filler, it's nothing special. Next, we're going to go to Hazaret's Undying Fury, which for four generic and two red is rare and a sorcery, and it says shuffle your library, then exile the top four cards. You may cast any number of non-land cards with converted mana cost five or less from among them without paying their mana costs. Lands you control don't untap during your untap step. So yes, this is the red version of the cycle of overexertion cards, the cards that make you tap, make your lands not untap for a turn. Um, and these cards are sort of hard to evaluate in general, but I think this one's pretty, maybe the easiest one to evaluate. It's just not very good. Cards that are this random are dangerous to put in your limited deck. There is every chance you only get one to two cards for free out of this deal, and it's not for free because you just paid six mana and your six lands at least aren't going to untap next turn. And being impactful is not something guaranteed about the top four cards of your library. Sure, there will be times where people cast this and get four cards out of it and just win the game. But I think more typically, this will do very little to change the course of the game other than make you lose more quickly because you just only got one or two spells worth of card, cards worth of spells for six mana. Um and your lands aren't going to tap next turn. So that's a massive downside. This card just doesn't do enough. Um, even compared to the other cards in this cycle, I think it's the worst of all the cards in the cycle. Um, it's just likely to cause you to instantly lose the game more than it is to help you win a game. And I'm going to steer completely clear of this and give it an F. Next, we have Hour of Devastation, which for three generic and two red is a rare sorcery, and it says all creatures lose indestructible until end of turn. Okay, that's cool. Hour of Devastation deals five damage to each creature and each non-Bolas Planeswalker. I am a big fan of board sweepers. My own playstyle generally pushes me towards dirtily, so I may rate them a little higher than most, but you'd be hard-pressed to find someone who'll tell you that a board sweeper like this one isn't a great card the kind of card you want to start a draft with. It even removes indestructible from creatures. Funnily, it doesn't actually kill all of the indestructible gods, as Oketra, for example, is too big to die from it. But still, it is going to blow up most of the board, even taking down Planeswalkers in the process, as is the case with all board sweepers. They aren't going to be that good in super aggressive decks. But if you have this in your hand as a sort of insurance policy in your aggressive deck, once things go wrong, if things do go wrong, it can sort of reset the board and help you do the last few damage to your opponent. You can also coax your opponent into just curving out for a while while you do very little, and then on turn five, get a four for two or something like that that basically gives you the game. I'm all in on Hour of Devastation, and I think it is a first pickable card because of the massive impact it can have on the game. I'm going to give it an A-. minus. Next, we have Imminent Doom, which for two generic and a red is an enchantment at rare. It says Imminent Doom enters the battlefield with a Doom counter on it. 
It also says, whenever you cast a spell with converted mana cost equal to the number of doom counters on imminent doom, imminent doom deals that much damage to target creature or player. Then put a doom counter on imminent doom. In basically every format, every color gets a card or two that was obviously not designed with limited in mind, but was printed with other formats or for casual players in mind. And that's what Imminent Doom is. I think it's mostly for casual players. It reminds me a little bit of As Foretold. People tried to play that in this limited format, and I had some people tell me it worked out for you. But the problem with As Foretold and Imminent Doom is that you're playing these and hoping you get the exact right distribution of spells to take advantage of this card's ability. In other words, you have to have a one mana spell to even get to the two counters, and then you have to have a two mana spell to get to three counters. And that's just not going to happen consistently and limited. It just won't work out. Your deck won't even probably have enough spells at each place on the curve to make it worth it, just like it wasn't worth it with As Foretold, which does something similar. It lets you catch spells for free if they happen to be at the right mana cost. It, it just won't work out. Limited decks are never consistent enough for this sort of thing. This card is unfortunately a straight F in Limited, but it does seem like a fun card to brew around in Constructed. Next, we have Inferno Jet, which for 5 generic and a red is a sorcery at Uncommon, and it says Inferno Jet deals 6 damage to target opponent. It also has Cycling for 2 mana. I always hate burn that can only go to your opponent's face, mostly because when I first read the card, I get optimistic, and I assume it can hit creatures. So here's a PSA. This one can't, only your opponent's face. The other reason I don't like burn that goes to your opponent's dome is that it is basically useless in any situation where it doesn't kill your opponent. Why? Because you just spent six mana to do something that didn't affect the board at all or damage your opponent's board at all. However, adding cycling to a card like this does make it much better. In the early game, you really don't want this at all since what you need to be doing is playing permanence. So if you draw it, then you can throw it into your graveyard. In the late game, it can do the last six damage to your opponent. And that's not a bad thing. Adding cycling to, you know, a lava axe effect like this actually makes it playable. I wouldn't normally play. If all this Inferno Jet was was doing six damage to my opponent, I wouldn't play it at all. But adding cycling actually significantly improves the card. It sort of pushes it all the way from, a, from an F to, I think, a C. This is because of the sort of split card nature of the card. It goes from being a lava axe effect to helping you draw a card. Plus, there's lots of cards in this format that care about cycling, that care about instants and sorceries, and so on. So Inferno Jet's a solid red playable. I wouldn't, you know, I'm not going to be pumped about it, but it's definitely an interesting card because normally I would give an F to this card if you just take cycling off. But I really think it jumps two full letter, grade, letter grades by adding cycling, and not all cards get that much of a bonus by adding cycling, but I think this one does. Now let's move on to Kenra Scrapper, which for two generic and one red is a Jackal Warrior at Common. And a 2-3, uh, it has Menace, and it says you may exert Kenra Scrapper as it attacks. When you do, it gets plus 2, plus 0 until end of turn. If you watch my Amonkhet limited review, you know that I underestimated many creatures with exert by about half a letter grade. I'm not going to make this mistake this time, especially with a creature like this who does something pretty powerful when exerted. Becoming a 4-3 Menace every other turn is the kind of thing that is a nightmare for an opponent to deal with. And he plays especially well with combat tricks that give you two for ones left and right. Generally, any large creature with Menace is good with combat tricks because your opponent is just put in a place where they have to block with two creatures and then all of a sudden you pump your guy, blow out both their creatures, or you kill one of their creatures. And so the Menace, you know, you, you kill the other creature in combat and... It, making your opponent block with two creatures just opens up the door for you to do all sorts of heinous things. A 3-mana 2-3 with Menace is already a card knocking on the door of C range, probably about a D+, plus, but adding Exert to it pushes this Jackal all the way up to C+, plus for me. I'm happy playing him in basically any red deck and willing to take him relatively early. Next, we have Kindled Fury, which for one red mana is an instant at common with target creature gets plus 1, plus 0, and gains first strike until end of turn. This is a combat trick we've seen a few times. It's always a fine card. Costing only a single mana certainly makes this attractive, as you can usually do a lot more on your turn than use Kindled Fury to take down an opponent's creature, and leaving one red mana up on your opponent's turn is easy to do. You're just going to have that happen anyway. This trick helps you break through larger blockers at a low cost, and there's always something aggressive decks want to be doing. It does have the downside that basically all combat tricks have, and that is that you open yourself up for a two-for-one if you play this while your opponent has untapped mana and cards in their hand, so keep that in mind. This is a solid C, with the big caveat that it probably is only going to fit into an aggro deck. Next, we have Magma Roth, which for three generic and a red is a 5-5 five, five elemental at uncommon, and it says at the beginning of your upkeep, put a minus one, minus one counter on Magma Roth. And it also says whenever you cast a non-creature spell, remove a minus one, minus one counter from Magmaroth. 
A four mana five five is nice, but one that gets a minus one minus one every counter every turn isn't very good. It would probably be like a D if that's all this was. However, this card fits well into blue red spells and any other deck that has a solid number of non-creature spells, where it won't be hard to keep this guy at least four four most of the time. You can actually do some combat shenanigans with it too, during doing something like casting Kindled Fury suddenly generates more of an advantage out of nowhere as you get to move the minus one, minus one counter from it and it gets the boost. Almost like Prowess, since you could also cast an instant speed removal spell when an opponent blocks your Magmaroth with a 4-4 four, four, and end up getting an awesome 2 for 1. It's going to be a, a hard creature to block, almost like it has Prowess, like I said, because people won't be sure if you can remove the counter or counters from it. Still, this guy isn't going to have a home in any deck that isn't running close to 10 non-creature spells, but I think it has, it's like a C plus in decks that can take advantage of sort of building around him. Next, we have Manticore Eternal, which for three generic and two red is a 5-4 zombie Manticore with a flick three. And it says Manticore Eternal attacks each combat if able. The combination of having to attack all the time and afflict is a pretty cool card design-wise because it makes the big downside of creatures who attack every turn a little bit less of a downside. That downside is that eventually your opponent will be able to block and kill your guy, maybe without even losing a creature. But in this case, once they can do that, they still have to eat some damage. A 5-mana five 5-4 five is a pretty big beater, so blocking it isn't always going to be easy the first time it swings. And even if your opponent does, it does 3 damage to them. That feels like it's worth a card to me. Trading and somehow doing damage seems like it's worth a card. Um, he will be especially potent with combat tricks. From my first impression of this set, I think it is going to be a little slower, as I mentioned, than Triple Amonkhet. And because of that, I think Manticore Eternal is going to be an okay curve topper for red aggressive decks in the format. In Triple Almond Cat, he probably would have been too slow, but in this format, I think he's a solid C. Next, we have Neheb the Eternal, who for three generic and two red is a mythic zombie Minotaur warrior who is a 4-6 with a flick three, and at the beginning of your post-combat main phase, add red to your mana pool for each one life your opponents have lost this turn. I underrated the last version of Neheb, and I'm going to try not to do it this time, because... I, but I don't think this card is an A range or what I would call a bomb. This card is certainly playable, one I'd be happy to have in any red deck, and even one that I'll first pick in a lot of packs. But he doesn't possess the power that you might expect from a mythic legendary creature. He's difficult to block effectively, sure, but he doesn't hit super hard or anything. Your opponent has to choose between taking 3 or taking 4. In both cases, you're going to get red mana. This isn't sort of a, a hard decision as it can be on some of the other creatures with afflict um it's going to be pretty obvious which one you should do um the mana he gives you is definitely nice this is a format that seems to have several mana sinks in it and him helping you play two spells in a turn if you don't have mana sinks is also nice he's certainly a fine card but i feel like the, he doesn't quite do enough given his mana cost to really feel like a bomb still he's first pickable in a lot of packs just not those that also have big bombs or high quality premium removal in them but i'm going to give him a b Next, we have Open Fire, which for two generic and a red is an instant, and it says Open Fire deals three damage to target creature or player. Red always gets some very efficient instant speed removal at common that isn't very interesting to talk about. That's what Open Fire is. It's good, can even dome the opponent, and is a good but not premium removal spell. I would feel okay about first picking it, but not overjoyed. I'm going to give it a C plus. It may even inch into the B minus range. I'm just a little low on this sort of removal spell after seeing Electrify. Uh, which I think I gave a B minus to end up really underperforming in the last set, um, but maybe this will be maybe this will be better. So, on to the next card, which is Puncturing Blow, which for two generic and two red is a sorcery at common that says Puncturing Blow deals five damage to target creature. If that creature would die this turn, exile it instead. Red always gets efficient sorcery speed removal at common too, and Puncturing Blow is definitely that. Uh, four mana to do five to something is a very good rate, and the fact that you get to exile the creature when it dies is also good since this format is filled with creatures who do stuff in the graveyard. Still, we saw that Electrify and other removal spells with a converted mana cost of four or more were clunky in Triple Almond Cat, and while again I think this format is going to be slower than Triple Almond Cat, I don't think it will be so much slower that a four mana sorcery speed removal spell is going to suddenly be like a B plus, like it would be in some formats. You'll be happy to play this, just don't take it super early, but I'm going to give it a B minus. Next, we have Sand Strangler, which for three generic and one red is a uncommon beast and a 3-3, three, three, and it says, When Sand Strangler enters the battlefield, if you control a desert or there is a desert card in your graveyard, you may have Sand Strangler deal three damage to target creature. So red has two different 
beast creatures who uh, really like deserts, who are bad cards, basically, if you don't have deserts. This one's a 4-mana 3-3, the other one's a 5-mana 4-4. But then if you do have deserts, they increase significantly in their power level. So far from looking at the set, I think red, because it has a very good common and uncommon that care about deserts, is going to be maybe the, maybe the color that cares the most about having a few deserts in it, so keep that in mind. This one incentivizes you to be running deserts a ton as it goes from being a low mana, a lowly four mana three three, something I'd give like a D to, uh, to being a flame tongue kavu or close to a flame tongue kavu, something worthy of an A on its own. If you have three deserts in your deck, this becomes a pretty powerful card. With zero deserts, it's a D. Um, however, if you have enough deserts in your deck, even just four ish or something, I think it pushes all the way up to a ceiling of B+. Like when you cast this and it does three damage, it's an A, but it's not always going to be able to do that. But if you if you can at least make it so 60, 70% of the time when you cast it, it's doing that three damage, it gets into the B plus range for me. It's a, it's a great card if you can uh, pull off the desert synergy. Next, we have Thorned Moloch, which for two generic and one red is a 2-2 two -two lizard at common with prowess. And Thorned Moloch has first strike as long as it's attacking. Another card that seems to be aimed at helping improve the blue-red archetype. In red, it seems like that color pair has like been really supported uh, in this color pair, which I'm happy to see. It's usually one of my favorite archetypes in a format. Thorn Moloch's going to be an okay playable in decks that can't regularly take advantage of prowess. A creature with first strike who can get bigger at any moment is a real problem to block. Your opponent doesn't actually necessarily know that you don't have... Uh, a way to pump it in the early game. I mean, they won't block it with their 3-3 because the, they'll just get wrecked, so you'll get in for some damage at least. Um, but I think it's probably about a D-plus in a deck that can't trigger prowess regularly. I think it pulls all the way up to a C, though, in like a dedicated blue-red spells deck where it'll regularly be a 3-3, 4-4, and your opponent just has no hope of actually blocking it, so you're just getting in for 2 or 3 every turn. Our next card is... Wildfire Eternal, which for three generic and a red, is a Zombie Jackal Cleric at rare and a 1-4 with Afflict 4. That's very high Afflict. And it has when Wildfire Eternal attacks and isn't blocked, you may cast an instant or sorcery card from your hand without paying its mana cost. I like the design on this Afflict card a lot, as opposed to like Neheb. Your opponent doesn't really want to block or get hit by this creature. Neither option is attractive, but they have to do one or the other, right? And it isn't a decision I'm looking forward to having to make in the format, but it's a decision I'm looking forward to making other people make. Now, you have to be running a decent number of instants and sorceries for this card to be at its best, but even if you don't have one in your hand, you can definitely bluff your way into getting your opponent to block it the first time you swing with it. Still, the card is sort of narrow and really only going to be at its best in blue-red decks or red-black decks with a lot of removal spells, and because of that, I'm only willing to give it a C+. That does it for my review of all the red cards in Hour of Devastation. Um, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to click the like button. If you disagree with any of my grades, let me know in the comments and we can discuss things and try to figure out this format together. If you want to make sure you catch the rest of my limited review, as well as Hour of Devastation draft videos and a bunch of other magic content, don't forget to subscribe. Tomorrow, I'll be back to discuss all the green cards in Hour of Devastation. And the day after that, I'll be back with all the remainder of the cards in the format, which are artifacts, lands, and multicolored cards. So keep your eyes open for that. Also, I want to remind you guys that starting with Hour of Devastation, I have teamed up with FiveColorCombo.com to improve drafting on their app. My card ratings are now used to help determine when the AI should select the cards, so the app has become much more realistic in terms of draft. So it is a great way to prepare for the format. Go check it out at FiveColorCombo.com. You can find a link in the description below.